Welcome to Open Source for Researchers, a podcast showcasing open source software built by and for researchers. My name's Abby. And I'm Robin. And we're your hosts. Every other week, we interview an author published in the Journal of Open Source Software, or JAWS. This is episode 20, and today we're chatting with Milan Clover about their paper, Speedy Weather JL, Reinventing Atmospheric General Circulation Models Towards Interactivity and Extensibility. So Milan is a Schmidt AI and Science Fellow at the University of Oxford. So this is actually our final episode of season one. So we're trying out a couple of new yeah. things um, as we start to plan for season two. So one thing is we're not going to edit this, like the long version of this episode. So it might sound a bit different. So let us know your thoughts if you um, liked it or if we should try something else. Uh, you can comment on YouTube or Spotify or just tag us on social. Arfin, anything to add before? All right. So there we go. Kevin. No, that's a good uh, 20 episodes. It feels like a real uh, real achievement. So thanks for joining us on the, the last episode, helping us close. Yeah, nice to close out this season, Milan. Nice to meet you. Yeah, very excited to have you here. And I think this is our first Julia project. So really oh, excited to have I you. I think there I thought there was another one. I searched. I feel like there was another one. Oh, there's not? There's, okay. My, oh, maybe there was, but we never wrote down the word Julia in our notes. So There you go. Yeah. Okay. Well, there we go. That I, this is a um, this is a major omission. If this is the first Julia submission, given the given the rise of uh, Julia and scientific computing, so let's let's get going. So, um, Milan, tell us like what 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 is this uh, library? Like, what does it do? What is what is atmosphere atmospheric general circulation? Uh, what are yeah, one of those models? Thanks for that question. You um, atmospheric general circulation models is kind of like a mouth, right? There's a lot in it, but uh, it's actually what three years ago uh, um, a Nobel Prize in Physics was given to for the first atmospheric general circulation models that were built around like the 60s and 70s. People started with that. Obviously, back then, like I don't know, punch cards were still more of a thing than they are today. Um, but they, in the end, you start with physical equations, equations of how fluids move around, and in the end. The atmosphere is basically just a fluid. Um, and the way how we solve these equations is usually by discretizing these partial differential equations around the globe. And in the end, it gets computationally quite expensive. So back in the 60s and 70s, um, these models were quite simple. Some of them were literally just a single column of the atmosphere. Um, and then they started having yeah, three dimen the three-dimensional motion of the atmosphere. So wind could blow around, like blow up a mountain, could blow down a mountain. Usually would also resolve uh, well, yeah, temperature then and usually humidity. Uh, in the end, like over the last decades, people added more and more features so that you have representations of clouds, of precipitation, of radiation, uh, and so on and so forth. And um, so they became more and more and more complex. Um, interacting not just uh, with land, but also with the ocean, with sea ice. Um, people nowadays include uh, large parts of the stratosphere, which can have quite different dynamics to the troposphere, where most of our weather that we see if we look up into the sky happens. And uh, in the end, there are a very like, it's a zoo of different algorithms that all somehow come together um, that people want to play with and like experiment with and like try different things. Um, in the end, we often want to represent the atmosphere in a simplified way so that we can understand individual processes better. Um, but in order to get a really realistic picture of what's happening in the atmosphere for weather, but also for things like climate change, um, there is, you have to be like, basically have to include as many processes as possible. Uh, that means that the software that you write for that just becomes longer and longer and longer with more and more functions and objects and new types that you define and so on and so forth. And so, yeah, these kind of models become really big, complex software engineering projects, which basically a single person can't write everything anymore. And uh, you need a large team to do this. And uh, I've basically in the last, yeah, two, three years, I uh, worked on speedyweather.jl. Uh, which is reinvention of some of these um, models. Um, and we have a small team, 
but most of these other models that are currently used for weather forecasting and for climate change prediction have much larger teams and a much uh, longer legacy behind them. Thank you for that introduction. That's super, super interesting. I'm curious, you mentioned like, you know, modeling and you could do a short term thing like weather. And I actually heard an interesting fact the other day. You could maybe tell me if this is true or not, that every decade we get about a day extra forecasting prediction. So, you know, like 40 years ago, we could say what the weather might be like in the next two days, but now we're up to sort of six, seven. And in the next decade, we might get yeah, to eight exactly. or something. Is this that, is that what sort we of call the about quiet right? revolution like those sort of, of roughly numerical yeah, weather prediction? Because like numerical weather prediction, in contrast to like the actual okay. like climate modeling, Three years ago, got a Nobel Prize, but a numerical weather prediction technically never really got one. And there was never really like a really big breakthrough. I mean, there's now coming like with AI, there's now kind of like the next breakthrough on the horizon. Um, there was a bit of a breakthrough some 40 years ago when the first satellite products were used because previously the weather forecast was always um, way more accurate for the Northern Hemisphere than for the Southern Hemisphere because guess what? There was more data available to start these models from in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, but basically, the Southern Hemisphere in the 90s kind of caught up. And since then, we have what we call like the quiet revolution of numerical weather prediction. And about every yeah decade or so, the forecasts get one day better. But obviously, it's a question, how long is that possible? Because technically, yeah. we have something that we often call like the real butterfly effect. And the real butterfly yeah. means there's kind of like a predictability of two horizons. So whatever perfect model you have available, whatever computing resources you have available to solve these questions, you may still have a, a barrier that you can't push through. And that might be, we don't really know where it is. And we know that some things are a bit more predictable than others. But even if you had like the perfect software, the perfect computer, you could never forecast, uh, like you could never forecast the tornado 20 days into the future or something. Right. And so for, for speedyweather.jl, um, is there, it, it, it weather's in the name. So it is the target here weather rather than climate models. Is that a fair? Yeah. The name, the name actually has a bit of a history called? because, um, when I was about to finish my PhD, there was a Fortran model available. Um, and that Fortran model was called speedy and it's some acronym that I don't really remember what it stands for. It was something with like simplified physics. Um, and. That model was kind like it kind of did the job, but it also was very clunky. Um, I hope Franco Maltini is not listening to this because he wrote this model. But, um, and so I basically wanted to reapproach the can we reinvent this? Can we make this really user friendly? Can we make it so that you really feel like you're sitting in a, like a Lego playground and you can just stitch things together and it just works? Um, and so I didn't want to give it quite the same name as it had because I knew it wanted to be something different but I also wanted to give credit to the conceptual model of something I, I don't want to like didn't want to start completely from zero something completely different and so I basically looked a lot into like oh what is the balance between really complex algorithms and where do they take like simplifications what is the complexity that I want this model to because in the end, um, you could, any climate process, you could have an entire team working on this for a decade in order to make this really, um, just make this one part of the model really accurate. And so you always have to find a balance between what is good enough. And so I really appreciated how this old Fortran model chose the, this good enough um, level. And that's why I kind of wanted to give them a little bit of credit. And that's why I left the speedy in the name. But in order to really say like what we're doing is like the model is supposed to simulate the weather, then it was speedy weather. You could have also maybe called the speedy atmosphere, but speedy weather will have just more of a ring. Yes, yeah, speedy weather cool. is Thanks. really nice. Um, I do have your paper open right now, and there's some beautiful images. Uh, this is probably not the best way to show it, but just in the year two, but... It, low actually, low production uh, cost uh, yeah. sharing. I really images like like there. the humidity one that's yes. into the like shallow water. <laughs> thing. But it sounds like there's a lot of different outputs from from this. Like you can have these images, you could have like weather yes. predictions, different data analysis. So it does cover yes, quite a lot. So there are 
Um, if we think about clouds and precipitation, for example, which are technically super complex processes with a, a lot of what we call microphysics. So these are kind of like the physics that really happen on the like micrometer scale, maybe even sometimes smaller. Uh, for example, like a cloud mm -hmm. really technically forms by um, like droplets growing. And then when it's like heavy enough, the raindrop falls down. Um, and this is, um, these are physics that happen on scales that could never really resolve in um, in these models, like even if you were to had like the computational resources right. of like the next, I don't know, and, and like 50 years ahead, uh, even then, um, you would not be able to resolve how these droplets actually form and how they rain down. And, um, this is, uh, something that, um, in like speedy weather, for example, we do take some shortcuts of complexity there. Um, this is a to make it basically more maintainable in the beginning, because that was then suddenly something that I could write down in a few days, um, instead of having an entire team working on it for, for a decade. Um, and so we do have this, um, variable called specific humidity We're using it. Specific humidity is basically always just like the, the mass of water vapor that you have in the mass of air, which contains more than water vapor, dry air. Um, and so this is one of the variables, but some models would go even more complex and would add more variables that would say like, well, actually like, let's also simulate the actual, uh, liquid water in the cloud and not just the water vapor. And so people have been adding more and more complexity, but even at the minimum, and this is coming back to this, like what is good enough for such a model, even at the minimum, you would have a variable like humidity, you would have temperature, you have the, the horizontal wind, uh, meaning the wind blows in this direction, that direction, that's sort of vector. Um, and you can also represent this as vorticity and divergence, a bit of physics. Um, and you need uh, surface pressure at least. And so depending on what variable you look at, you can create a lot of different pictures. And these are only the variables that we call like prognostic variables. So meaning those are the ones that send on the left-hand side of the partial differential equation. So they are basically, you in the end, from time step to time step, what you compute is how these variables change and a lot of other variables can then be diagnosed from those, but those are the core ones that determine how the weather inside the model actually evolves. Um, but you can, depending on what you look at, there's a lot of pretty pictures. That's always, yeah, the beauty of weather and climate modeling that the visualizations always look great. Yeah. Thanks for that. It sounds very, very cool. versatile. Yeah, for sure. Um, so can you tell us a bit about your background? Like what brought you, um, to a place where you created this package? You, you started to talk a little bit about some of the origin story of related software, but you know, could you share more about yeah. you and, um, and, uh, your so research I, background? I, I, I am a climate physicist. So that was my, that was my master's doing my PhD. I was a, worked a little bit more on computing. And I think that really brought me into this idea of, um, maybe like all the software that I'm writing anyway for my research, I kind of want to make this a bit more reusable. I want to have this a little bit higher standard than just writing down a notebook. Um, and so this is, I think where I came in and like as a PhD student, then I started like developing different software packages. Um, in the end, I've learned a lot about computer science from Julia because at the beginning of my PhD, it just happened. There was a package that was only available and Julia and I was like, oh, maybe you should try this out. And well, guess what, eight years down the line, is it eight years? Yeah, I think almost eight years now down the line, I'm still using this language. Um, and so I've, yeah, in the beginning, I've always wrote like really small toy models, so like for example, just like 2D models of like little box. And so you kind of have to simplify weather as like motion of some fluid inside a little, little square or so. Uh, and that's obviously not very representative of the real atmosphere. And so instead of, and this was always my approach, instead of, um, just using, um, a big operational weather forecast or atmospheric model that is used inside a climate model, um, which often they have like, I don't know, half a million, a million, five million, depending on which one lines of Fortran code, um, instead of just trying to use that, I was always like, oh, maybe I can just like reinvent that somehow like write my own because obviously the beauty of like writing the thing you by yourself is that sure you spend a lot of time up front 
but then you know every knob in your packages, in your model. And then if someone says like, could we do this? You immediately know and how to do it. And you can probably pull it off in five minutes, which otherwise if you work with a model that, um, that you haven't written yourself, it may take you a while. And this was really one of the, I basically towards the end of my PhD, I kind of identified this as like one major problem in our field is that uh, a lot of these big atmospheric models that are currently used every time you open your weather app, that's technically one of those models behind it, obviously not only phone, but on big supercomputers. And I felt that this was actually really holding back a lot of progress in our field. Because if you think about, and this is how it basically it is what the current standard is that first meeting with your supervisor, if you're PhD students, you talk about, oh, maybe you could do this project. And then we say like, oh yeah, maybe we could use this model. And then basically it takes an entire PhD project to somehow understand how an existing Fortran model works, to tweak it for the experiment that you want to do. So you're actually able to like run it on the supercomputer, press play, analyze the data, write a paper about it, basically it takes years. And I felt like, wow, this can't be it. We, uh, can we not somehow build something that is more intuitive, that is like just easier to use? So that really I had this like idea, I mean, it's obviously saturated, but I still have this idea of like, can we not create, make the model so usable that on a Monday you come up with the idea, on a Tuesday you implement it, on a Wednesday you run some simulations, on a Thursday, analyze them on a Friday, you start writing the paper about it. Like how amazing would that be? Um, and that is definitely just currently not, not possible with the, with the models we have. And so speedy weather is a little attempt, kind of try to shorten this time scale of your like idea, what I always call idea result and over time, I think this is reusable software can really play a massive role in actually advancing climate science. No, that makes a huge amount of sense. And I, I love how you're thinking about the usability of this and just make it easier for other PhD students who don't want to spend a whole PhD project trying to understand a model. Um, so does this mean your audience is a little bit different than existing software for the, in this space because it's so much um, easier I to use? I definitely think that it has an impact. So, um, there is, um, in, this, in our field, there's definitely a hierarchy. So I think all of the the old school Fortran developers would probably look down on everything that isn't uh, written in Fortran, uh, unfortunately. Maybe some will also look up because they're like, oh, I still have to use Fortran and uh, there's all these other cool languages around now and maybe we could do this, but well, we're not paid to build an entire big model um, based on another language. So maybe I was also a bit lucky in that situation. Um, but the what I found quite interesting is that the, the audience that we had, especially in the beginning, was a, a lot of people that are somewhere in the adjacent to the whole machine learning field because they were basically looking for, oh, there's like weather forecasting is a challenge for AI. And so people wanted to, to, to yeah, start working on this because they thought like, oh, maybe there's some like cool papers you can write, some cool research you can do. And so, sure, you could just like... Um, pull out some, uh, some, some, some data that normal models have produced. And I mean, the data that in, in the end, these, this data is just years of once and like, where you get it from, it's like, um, what is like, it's not much as, uh, not as much of a language question than anymore. Um, but there were quite a few people that at the, even at the very beginning, um, decided to just, yeah, just run speedy weather, uh, produce some data and then see how much can they learn this data various uh, approaches and with like machine learning. And so they basically always used this model as a, as a baseline. And I found that quite interesting because it wasn't people that um, already had a really good clue about atmospheric model and were people that came from outside the field. And um, I think that really made a difference because suddenly you have, it gave me the feeling that Speedy Weather is kind of lowering the barrier for people that aren't used to Fortran, aren't already in atmospheric modeling to suddenly use a package that might be just way easier for them to use than um, a lot of existing models. And so I hope kind of opening up to, to more people from the outside, uh, but obviously then also what we talked about for the usability for people within the field. They don't have to spend their entire PhD on, uh, on, on, on one project, but can actually maybe squeeze 10 in it or so.
<laughs> no, that's great. And I think whenever you bring in outside people into a problem in your field, that's where the magic happens. So really glad that you're seeing that happen. Cool. I also didn't know that Fortran yeah. was so widely used in climate science still. So that's interesting news for me. I mean, I was going to say, um, so uh, full disclosure, I learned to program in Fortran uh, in, in a chemistry lab. That was my first programming language, um, which was quite confusing. Uh, and, uh, you know, there are very large code bases in like computational chemistry as well in, in Fortran. My, my working assumption is that Fortran's used because it's fast at maths and also there's lots of legacy code, right? So you've got very big code bases. Um, um, what with, with the caveat that I, I actually firmly believe in the no tool shaming thing. Like I don't like talk negatively about other tools. Could you say why like Julia is superior in your opinion for these tasks? If you have, if, if that's the position you hold, like what do you get by adopting Julia over Fortran, for example? Yes. No, I do um, want we're to be, be polite, polite about because, Fortran. I mean, you have to just thing. acknowledge how long this <laughs> language has been around and given for how long it has been around, I actually like. I kind of like reading Fortran because it is not is not as um, obscure right. as like some other languages, and I find it quite quite readable in the end. And I think really the like I believe the the, the major problem of Fortran in going forward is um, or like the reason why it's used is that basically uh, allows quite good like array mathematics, so you can basically just uh, whatever your discretized equations look like, you can get this into code quite 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 easily um and exactly as you say the legacy also plays uh, plays a major role and then it's uh still pretty good for high performance and so this is why uh why it's used i think where fortran is losing up on and this is like a lot of people then talk about like modern fortran um but in contrast to many other languages i mean you have to like look at python and yeah, basically there's a new like um minor version coming out every like couple of months to couple of years. And so there's really progress, a lot of new features and languages that make it can make like a language really nicely usable. Um, and you don't have to wait for, I don't know. I mean, when I say Fortran, um, I literally mean that there's a, still a lot of models around that I've written in Fortran 77. And that is, uh, that is mind blowing. Yeah. What, what's yes. the first? First that five one. spaces of the punch card feeder, exactly. right? Like that's the one I learned in all caps. Or I remember for Chan 90, I was like, oh, yes, I can exactly. use lowercase. And Amazing. <laughs> yeah. So that obviously just, um, for, yeah, for me, then Julia really made a difference because um, I came from Python before. So I first, like I first learned MATLAB, then I learned uh, Python. I was like, oh, this is all open source. Really cool. I don't have to go through this like, um, IDE that always is like MATLAB and uh, I think I, does MATLAB still have that that every function has to be in one file kind of thing. I can't remember. Um, and so I really quite possibly Python there because yeah. I suddenly feel like I felt like I had a access to a really really big um, uh, software framework and like, uh, with like NumPy, Matplotlib, and integrate this all together, and I really like that. But I was basically always facing this issue in Python about speed. Like a lot of people came then about and said like, oh, maybe we can do all these cool things with like um, uh, number and now uh, jacks and so on. And so there's obviously people try to get the speed, speed back in Python, whereas most people came for the meta activity and the like readability, easy to write code quickly to like test out something. And when I first started using Julia, I realized, wow, I can basically for what I need, I can have the best of both worlds. Because it was really like, I can basically type, like, write things down as I write down Python. If I want to, I can do these, like, add these, like, little bits and pops here. I can, like, use some little macros. I can use some um, type declarations and so on. And it's still absolutely valid code. But you basically then are either super close to, um, like, the speed of a C or Fortran code. Or sometimes even, and I mean, I'm not a Fortran or C developer. Whenever I tried these things, I was even better because, like, a fourth pattern meaning Julia was faster simply because in, in Julia, found, because it's such a good language, I found it super easy to, like, try, oh, what happens if I write the algorithm this way around or that way around? Oh, this is faster. And so suddenly, I basically, simply because of this usability, it gave me 
the advantaged benchmark things in a, in a very convenient way and therefore found out, oh, actually I should do it this way because that's the faster way. Or like quickly tracking allocations. It's like, why is this part of the code so slow? And I was like, oh, I, this is a vector that's actually allocating. And like, I found this, uh, this is one thing I found always really difficult to, to, to do in Python, to really like keep track exactly of the types and because types tell you a lot about like what's actually happening under the hood. And then you realize, oh, no, 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 that's a, that's a, don't do this because you kind of do something stupid at fun time. Um, and Julia really basic was in the end was this language for me that basically gave me the, the best of both worlds. And this is kind of where speedy weather now comes from. It's that we believe that in one language, it solves what everyone in the Julia community always talks about solving the two language problem. It solves this two language problem for us as that we can have, um, quite some high performance stuff on the, on the backend. Um, at the moment, we're still like experimenting with that. Um, the GPU version of Speedy Weather is not out yet, unfortunately. Um, we're still working on that because atmospheric models are, there's just a zoo of algorithms and getting them all working on GPUs is the, not the easiest endeavor. Um, but at the same time, and this is the other end of the spectrum, um, we felt that we had really this like super usable interface. And I love this idea that you can just like write down an atmospheric model in a notebook. You can just basically construct your model from the ground up. You say like, oh, I want to have this, this kind of precipitation. I want to have this kind of treatment of like, or like I want to have this kind of orography, like mountains in my simulation. I want to have, I want the, the ocean to be this. I want to change the land sea mask like this. And you have all these different components in the end make up, make up our climate system. And I basically can just like construct them in a notebook and just say like, uh, orography equals this, no, 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 equals that. And I can basically just put them all together into one. We then often call like them, call it like the model, the model object. Um, and then you initialize it to a simulation. You basically just hit enter and it just simulates something. It can go back and forth. You can intercept at all these various stages. You can analyze some parts like, oh, what happened in the first day? Why did it rain over the Yamalayas? You can actually just look at the individual fields inside the model, and it will tell you a lot about what actually happened in the climate system while you pressed a button. Um, and this is obviously something that you, in these, let's say, old school uh, languages, um, you can't do as easy because you basically, in the end, you have compiled code and you can can change a name list. Actually, I think we recently found out the, the first interface to an ocean model is like 60, 70 years ago. And they literally had like a little uh, text file with like this name list of like variable one is this, uh, variable two is this, and that was the interface back then. Mm. And nowadays we believe something like a notebook interface, or you can do it in the terminal, or you can still write the scripts. You have all these different ways to do this. Um, you have suddenly way more options to actually interactively simulate something. You can start, stop, you can look at things in between, you can visualize them, you can exactly what you want to have from a, from a notebook. And so, yeah. Speedy Weather tries to bring something that is as complicated as a, as an atmospheric model into the world of notebooks and uh, doing analysis, visualization, and simulation all in one. It sounds like a really rich, expressive interface. Oh, congrats! That sounds really cool. Yeah. Um, yeah, and it's been really interesting seeing the rise of Julia with scientific computing lately, especially to, for the reasons that you mentioned and just how flexible it's made us be doing other. Um, but I did want to ask a bit about your background in open source. I know you mentioned like learning Python and being part of this like open language, open community. Have you maintained other open source projects before? Why did you yeah. decide to make this um, one open source? I have. I probably created my GitHub account at some point when... When I was a master's student, still, yeah, doing everything in, in Python. And I think basically my approach to open source software back then was like, I don't know, every other week or so, I was just like, kind of like, I don't know, copy pasting my entire, all my, all the functions that I wrote and it kind of just like manually pushed it to GitHub. That was it. Um, so obviously, uh, very different from, uh, from the way how I work nowadays, actually with this whole, like, um, yeah, it actually like using much more functionality of Git than just every now and then copy, copy pasting, uh, the current state of your work poker. Um, and with the, yeah, once I started learning Julia, I, and this is maybe also, I talked about this two language problem that, um, yeah, many people believe exists in, yeah, 
many the usage of many languages that in the end you actually combine one language with another in order to get kind of cover more of the spectrum of what you need. Um, and I believe this also leads to um, a phenomenon where it is very hard for a user to become a developer and for a developer to understand the user um, because if you have two languages, you essentially always create some barrier in the middle. And this barrier can be that you, yeah, you don't necessarily understand what the other side's doing or why they're doing it. You can't, sometimes you can still like somewhat read what the other side's doing, but sometimes it's difficult for you then, for example, as a user to become a developer. With Julia, we realized that actually if we try to, um, yeah, if we, if we try to write good software, then every user who's like becomes an experienced user for them, we lower the barrier of them becoming developed. And this is definitely what I experienced starting with Julia. At the beginning, just a user of some packages, I realized, oh, I want to have the kind of this functionality. Um, and then probably just interacting in the UK with other Julia developers, they would say like, yeah, you can just like throw this into a package and so on. And it might be, it might be cool. And so suddenly I was like, oh, on this, on this edge of becoming a developer. And I think this is really one of the, one of the really, like, really beautiful things that I find about Julia, that this barrier between user and users becoming developers really, really low. Um, and that was my, that was basically my, 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 my road that I started. I think my first, my first Julia package was a really small one. At some point I registered it. I, I still, I, I would need to look up which one it actually is, but I'm pretty sure I don't retain it anymore. And it's like, kind of like forgotten somewhere. Unless you obviously can still install it via the package manager, but it's, um, that was interesting. And then for um, for speedy weather, I, I kind of I find it almost I, I don't even want to say like I decided to open source it because with speedy weather already I basically turned in the other way around. Like I, the first thing I did was creating a repository before I even uh, started coding anything and. I realized that this is so immensely useful to attract people and users, obviously in the beginning, but the users, as I said, can also be very good um, developers right from the beginning. And so basically we would not have, I think maybe except for like one or two, but we would not have any of the other developers if it wasn't open source right from the start. Um, so I can always encourage to open source things right from the start. It's a way of advertising your work. Uh, I find it's a very powerful way of advertising your work. You can get contributors quite early on. Uh, you don't have to like work in your, you know, in your own four walls and no one knows what you're doing. Um, and yeah. it puts a, puts a name on, like it puts your name onto, onto a project right early on. Because I think this is really also important in science, um, especially the part of science um, writes more and more software. So like the scientists that become software engineers is that it's, mm -hmm sometimes difficult to get credit um, because obviously the, the currency for scientists normally mm. is papers and citations. Um, and then once you write, start writing software or you kind of, you spend so much time writing something technically doesn't really fit into a paper. Um, it's okay, the support of a lot of papers doesn't really fit into it. And this is obviously then where, where JOS is like immensely helpful that you actually get something that people can cite and kind of like the, the downside of me going open source right from the beginning was that a lot of people actually started using this before the just paper was even written and so we have a bunch of citations that are just like pointing <laughs> to some like zenodo doi and that's it and so i was there was then obviously yeah. pressure to actually write something so that people can cite it so that actually um you get uh you get the citations and kind of like try to redirect everyone who's using it oh please this one now um but this is this is exactly like where we are now yep. and i think so going open source right from the beginning is the, uh, is the right way of doing it. I would recommend it to almost everyone. Um, I guess there's sometimes like confidential data and so on that that's sometimes obviously difficult to handle with, but at least that is a problem that in um, climate science, we basically don't really have. So there's, it's a very, yeah, the standard is very, very much established that we do um, almost everything open source. Nice. I was going to I was going to ask you about Joss, but you you basically answered my question. I mean, I think that it sounds like Joss is a good fit and um for for what you're doing and you know the fact that 
so much of modern science software is such a significant contribution um, to that science happening. Um, that's you know, the origin story of Just is very, very close to I think what what uh, what you are doing with this project and getting credit for that work. I wanted to just uh, ask, maybe just to sort of close us out here. Um, what are what are you looking for contributions wise on the project? Uh, you know, you're on GitHub. You've got um, an active project there. I think you mentioned something about GPU libraries are a bit of a pain in the butt yeah. right now. So maybe you'd like some help with debugging that. Just curious, what if the project's open for contributions? Yes. What what no, contributions absolutely. are you so actually looking for? We are open to contributors. If you listen. Oh, this sounds interesting. I want to have a look. Um, please do have a look. And also, please, I think still the best way of just getting in contact is just like opening up an issue and saying like, oh, hey, I've tried to do this and this and I was interested in this. I have a question here. I have a question there. Because um, I sometimes find it almost a bit like frustrating if I realize, oh, someone has used my packet for like months and they've like added these things and like some colleague tells me, oh, there's this other person who has actually done this with your model. And I'm like, what? I didn't know about this. Um, which is sometimes the downside of, of open source that keep, it's hard to keep track of um, yeah, how people are actually using your software. Um, but so the best way is always just to get in contact. Um, as I said, just open up an issue. The way the, the the types of contributions can really range from I've used your model and I run into this problem I did not understand this which sounds like sometimes like a like like a dumb question but it's actually a super useful question because if you're working on this um, you know, almost full time like me um, you sometimes things you sometimes think that things are intuitive where they aren't actually for new users and sometimes even asking the questions of like, I don't understand why is this this way and not that way. I actually read the questions. Um, then you definitely can be a contributor um, if you already know something about um, atmospheric physics or atmospheric modeling. Um, we can definitely point you into the right direction. For example, to add a new scheme to represent surface fluxes or evaporation, all these kind of things. Um, there's definitely a lot of scope for that. Um, but also if you don't know about atmospheric modeling, but you're like um, a developer in some language doesn't necessarily have to be Julia, but you want to learn something about Julia. Um, you can absolutely also contribute. There's a lot of, um, we have a lot of issues. None of, like, not necessarily all of them are actual issues on GitHub. Some of them, unfortunately, always just in, in, in my head or in the my, my colleagues' heads. Um, that's, I guess, how it's life. Um, can't, you can't always write down all the issues that you, that you actually face. Um, and there are lots of things around like, uh, yeah, like performance, um, getting things on GPUs somehow, how do you, um, yeah, how do you translate some parts of the code, uh, writing documentation? Um, I realized that, uh, I think in the, for the JOS paper, there was one reviewer who kindly asked, like, there needs a bit more documentation on this part. And I realized, yes, there really is needed more documentation. And so I spent weeks on weeks. Weeks on yeah, weeks to, to common to feedback. Write more on it. And yeah, I realized yeah. in the end, it's kind of like a little bit, the documentation is almost like a little textbook on like introduction to atmospheric modeling, uh, hands on <laughs> examples. <laughs> and so if you want to learn something about atmospheric modeling and you come from the, um, uh, not like from, from any other field of, of computer science, you're obviously also more than welcome. This is just like, give it a go, go look at, have a look at the documentation, try some of the examples. If you realize something works, something doesn't work, feel free to just open up an issue. And, uh, once I know you, hello, then, um, you, we can obviously like, you can yeah, start contributing more if you have the time for, and I think we also have a kind of also on the JOS paper. I feel like there's some JOS papers that only have like single two authors, three authors, and I think we have like 10. So we were basically very much saying like, hey, everyone who contributed, you're obviously all part of the part of the team. And I think this is a philosophy that we definitely want to carry forward. That we say, um, sure, some people contribute more than others. Some people are directly paid for this. I'm like to be kind of directly paid to, to work on this. Some others may not, and they do it as a side project. Um, but all of them should obviously get credit. And whatever papers we write on this should have rather more than 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 fewer authors. You can be quickly part of the team, and I hope this is encouraging. Thank you. 
That's amazing. Sounds like there's lots to dive into. And I really like that model, how you credited so many authors on the paper. Um, but uh, yeah, just to close us out, how can people follow you online? Um, Keep up yeah, to date with your work. Yeah, that's absolutely. You can, uh, you can obviously just switch on the notifications for the repository. Um, you always find me on, um, you can always just look on my website that I try to keep up to date with, uh, like the latest presentations, talks that I gave. Um, I am still on Twitter slash X, um, even though I feel like the days of the good old Twitter are kind of like almost gone now. Um, but you do find some of, uh, some on, on me there, like just, just look for, um, you know, and I'm also now on my blue sky. Um, that I find is it's more getting more more exciting. Um, so, yeah, just uh, follow any of these or just write me an email every now and then. That also works. Perfect. Amazing. You you answer yes, emails I try that, to. Or, or or read them at least. So that's that's not always the case. Yeah. Hey Milan, um, thank you so much for spending time with us today. It's been really really interesting to learn about uh, speedyweather.jl and. Um, Loved hearing your energy for the project and, and how you're thinking about improving the state of uh, software available in a, you know, we didn't talk about this, but in a, you know, a really important part of uh, scientific computing and software. It's, uh, so thanks, thanks so much thanks for, again for your time. Making so just cast a thing. So it's great work. And making just in the first place. Thank you so much for listening to JossCast, open source for researchers. Like we said at the beginning, this is the final episode of season one. Some of you know I started this podcast on parental leave. So now that I'm back at work, we're looking at ways to streamline the production of the podcast to make it a little bit more sustainable long term. So let us know what you thought of today's minimally edited episode. Leave a comment, tag us on social media. For now, we'll see you in season two. Open Source for Researchers is produced and hosted by Arvin Smith and me, Abby Kunak-Mays. Minimally edited by Abby and music CC by Foxcat Games. <laughs>